So Graymark asks, why do some cars fail so early? Let's really dive into the five reasons why in fact, some cars can literally last almost forever with a little bit of minor maintenance and others just fall off the planet and you'll find them over in the junkyard before way too long. As a matter of fact, some cars I've seen off the road in the dumpster before three years of age. And we'll take it right from the top. First key element is has to do with manufacturing. There's no secret these days that every corporation is basically driven by the bean counters. They're always looking for creative ways to save money, make money, and basically come out way ahead of the game. That's always been the primary objective. So one of the key manufacturing mistakes, in my opinion, personally, I believe, is the fact that Look at Porsche. What have they done? Some of their cars are now manufactured in Finland or elsewhere, not just Germany anymore. How about Volkswagen? A lot of their cars are manufactured in Mexico. Why is that? It's all about facilities, yes, but also lower cost of labor, lower cost of you know operating conditions, maybe whether it's taxation systems within a given country. Germany's quite high. Obviously, a lot of these other countries do provide some tax shelters and breaks, basically a lower cost of production. Now, with that, there's other impacts on a negative way for example quality control which we'll talk about that's one of the elements but those things can be a little more removed in the manufacturing process other things manufacturing that i'd like to touch on look at gm for a while back remember when they were gluing their hinges on their doors so essentially take their full-size door and people thought it was ludicrous but they would take a door that conventionally had a hinge and bolt it into the chassis and that was very structurally sound. Then they came along, hey, here's some money saving opportunities that we can glue that hinge on. So they did away with the bolts, which probably cost them 25 cents a piece. But when you're breeding millions of vehicles, obviously every bolt that you put in times how many per vehicle is a cost savings. So they use glue instead, much lower cost. Now the doors weren't really falling off, but those are one example of some areas where manufacturing were cutting costs. Some other manufacturers, for example, Toyota and Lexus, are more dialed in with the quality control while a vehicle's in its manufacturing process, while it's going down the assembly line. As a matter of fact, they also interject when there's issues, and all of a sudden they're finding at the end of the road where people are starting to take possession of the vehicles. If there are issues popping up, Toyota Lexus has historically known and taken pride on the fact of the quality control. They'll re-inject and apply the change in real time to make sure that those failures don't continue down to the end of an assembly line. Now, not every manufacturer takes that time. They'll run, run the gambit because to interrupt manufacturing process costs money. Now, a lot of manufacturers just let their vehicles run it, and then that's just the way it is and like it or lump it. And another shortcut that's really reared its ugly face in terms of manufacturing, for example, BMW. Everybody knows that BMW, after 60, 70, 80,000 miles, you're going to start seeing leaks. Coolant hoses, everything's plastic. There's lots of conversation about that, but it's more than just the parts and the quality of the parts. It's all about the manufacturing process. And if you can develop a part that snaps together really quickly, can you imagine what that does for time savings along the assembly line? Absolutely phenomenal. If you can get a technician that just snap, 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 snap all these hoses together, that's going to save immense amount of time versus some of the other car manufacturers where they have to squeeze the hose on, put on that constant tension spring, and then and Bob's your uncle, but it takes time and it consumes time and time is money. So those are other shortcuts where manufacturers start to get creative. They also package cars and their vehicles in such a way that make them easy to assemble as a unit, drop them into the car, but then they're a nightmare during the post. So when you actually have to bring your car in for service, the car has 100,000 kilometers, 60,000 miles on it, and it's ready to access. Say, for example, a water pump. Very difficult to change on some vehicles. Doesn't need to be, but it often is for the sake of manufacturing and producing the modular package that's much nicer, quicker, and easier to produce in the factory who cares about the after effect? Manufacturers only have to warranty their vehicles for three or four years. And then after that, it's at the customer's expense. So yes, manufacturing is a huge impact. And a lot of it has to do with the vendors and the manufacturers themselves finding creative ways to stick handle that and save costs. The second reason why cars fail so early has to do with the cheap parts. Now, not every car brand is using cheap parts and a lot of manufacturers know that that can potentially sting them. But did you know that a lot of times every single button, whether it's on your calculator or your phone 
or that button on the dashboard of your car actually has an engineered lifespan. It's good for X amount of operations, 10,000, 20,000 operations, and then that button typically starts to wear out. Well, these manufacturers aren't stupid, but of course to manufacture a button or equipment that's going to last virtually forever starts to cost a lot more money. You have to build everything up to a higher standard. But why spend the money there if you know that people are going to kick that vehicle down the curb, you know, in a few short years? Who cares? The next car is going to be the latest and greatest anyhow. Whether it's the latest Merc or Audi or Porsche or BMW, doesn't really matter. Maybe even the latest Lexus. They know that most people are just going to hold on to their cars for three to five years, turf them down the road. They don't care about that five year. They don't care about the third, fourth, and fifth owners. They know they're going to suck it up and there's no way to go but either pay through the dealer or some crappy, scuzzy little independent shop. So unfortunately, the quality of parts are designed for failure, if in mind. And maybe not so deliberately. And maybe that's a little bit of a harsh saying. And in my personal opinion, some of it's designed obsolescence, some of it's intentional, but some of it's just, again, based on the bean counters. Let's put a car part in there that's going to cost us a little less money and that's going to save us in the long run. Otherwise, like I said, it all comes down to the bottom line, spending the dollars and cents. Lift up the hood of any modern day German car these days and you'll find a lot of plastic parts. BMW is notorious for it, but honestly, a lot of brands are like that. I even talked to a great mechanic buddy of mine named Ed, who works on German, Italian cars all day, every day. And he's worked on them since 1973, and he's still working on them today. And he's seen that transition. He's even seen brands like Porsche and the 911, how they used to be every single fitting was screwed on with a screw or a nut or an Allen key fitting. And everything was actually bolted and screwed together. Most parts were metal, and the plastic parts didn't matter. They weren't functional. They were more for cosmetics. But even Porsche now has elected to move a lot more to plastic parts and pieces. Unfortunately, it's where it gets problematic is, for example, cars like BMW, Mercedes, and all of those start putting those plastic parts in critical areas, hot areas. We talk about the hot V in the BMW N63 twin turbo V8. Great engine fundamentally, but it's a hot V and they have all this plastic equipment around the turbos. The turbos are in the V and all that heat just sort of stays encapsulated, starts to melt down the heads and valve guides and all of the plastic parts and wiring insulation, everything starts to take a beating. And that isn't unique for BMW. Of course, all that heating cycles within turbochargers vicinity is going to start taking a toll on all of those coolant hoses. Heat, cold, hot, cold. And those heating cycles will start to crack fittings, plastic. Think about it. BMW, using electric water pumps, for example. Why would you possibly want to do that? Well, their justification really is because it produces less drag on the crankshaft. The crankshaft is essentially your main reciprocating mass driving your pistons or being driven by your pistons that are being fired. If you apply extra drag on there, of course you reduce a little bit of power, but it's negligible. And most conventional mechanical water pumps are driven off a belt which comes indirectly off that crankshaft. So the more drag you have on that crankshaft, the more power loss. BMW uses an electric water pump now in more of their modern day vehicles, which takes that drag off. Now it's more of an electrical function. The problem is now you have an electric motor, plastic fittings, and all of that with scalding hot coolant flowing through it. What do you think is going to happen? So it's the choice of some of these materials that's causing some of these failures and unfortunately is causing the imminent failure and quick and early death of a lot of these cars. Now, it's not that you can't fix that. Of course, you can replace a water pump. It's a part. Take it out, put another one in. The problem is, after five years when that car was 50,000 new and all of a sudden that car is only worth $15,000 and you've got to come along and you've got a water pump thermostat combo that started to fail. Then you've got a couple coolant hoses. Now, all of a sudden you throw labor shop rate on that and now you're into it for a $4,000 bill. That hurts when the car's only worth $13,000. $14,000, $15,000, doesn't it? That's minor maintenance, but it gets to a point where it becomes not practical to spend money because parts are so expensive, but the quality is not in line with the cost of these parts. A lot of these parts are plastic, as I say, not just unique for BMW, but a lot of the German car manufacturers are going that way. And a lot of plastic part selection under the engine in the engine compartment is one of the major contributing factors to early death of a lot of those cooling hoses and parts and pieces. And again, it's all pieces. You can change all of that. You can rebuild an entire car, but to what end and to what expense? It's the choice of parts that is taking a toll and leading people to make that hard decision. Take it or leave it. 
So the third element that can contribute actually to an early death or demise of a modern day vehicle is essentially design. And some cars are great at it and some cars aren't so good at it. And I've often said this, BMW makes amazing engines. Porsche makes amazing engines. It's not the engines that are usually the issue, other than with the odd exception of a timing chain that's a chronic issue with certain engines and certain variations or years. But usually the engines themselves are very stout. A lot of times BMWs are building very tight tolerances. Everything is made to run within a very strict tolerance. It's made to run high performance, very efficiently, great output. They're great drivetrains by very design. But it's, as I've said before, it's the design of the very parts, all those plastics. That was a decision somewhere along the way to incorporate all those plastic components around that structurally sound engine. It's not only that. Then you look at other car manufacturers, look at Dodges and Chevys. Particularly, I like to use the word Dodge and Jeep and those products where you can have half inch panel gaps. Look at Tesla, same storyline, half inch panel gaps, three eighths inch panel gaps. And yet you can get a brand new Porsche 911 with eighth inch panel gaps and it's tight and it's consistent all the way along because it's properly designed. It's well engineered. It's perfect. It's nice. And they take the time to do it right. Dodge, slap it together. It doesn't matter. Look at Tesla. One edge of a door panel gap can be an eighth of an inch. The next edge can be five eighths of an inch or half inch and it becomes just obscene. There's no secret that Tesla has been known for some of the poor quality control, but a lot of it's on the design end. Take time on the front end and you'll honestly, everything comes out properly in the back end. I do have an engineering background and I am of the firm belief a great plan yields a great result. If you don't plan it properly, if you don't design it properly, you're going to get a crappy result. Porsche, that's why they continually build very, very strong, stout, high-performing vehicles that for a German car are one of the most reliable on the market. Whereas BMW, a little lighter on the planning, a little more driven by the bean counters. Again, let's find those gaps. Let's find those ways that we can save money. And some of those parts by very design. When we talk about BMW and going back to the parts, going back to the design, do you realize BMW is highly vested in the idea of 3D printing? These manufacturers now are looking at opportunities to in-house create from recycled materials like plastic parts. For example, a lot of the plastic that comes out of your home winds up getting ground up, mushed, squeezed together, and shit out by a machine. Then they're used in in a 3D printer to remanufacture in your given BMW. Now, as it stands, a lot of those plastic parts that are 3D printed in BMW land are essentially going into internal parts or maybe not so structural, but that's irrelevant. The point of the matter is more and more use of plastic by very design is the generational change. Obviously, if we go back to 1980s and we think about the E30 BMWs, a lot of it was metallics. The cars were built a lot simpler, but they were a lot better designed at a very simplistic level. Porsche, same storyline. So it comes down to the very basics, the design and the intent of where we're gonna save money, where we're gonna maximize our profits and how much is just enough quality to put into this vehicle so it lasts three or four or five years, but not a whole lot longer because it's incrementally more expensive to produce a car and a design and parts to last 10 years plus. Most manufacturers don't even wanna try that. The fourth reason why many vehicles fail so early has to do with the fact of quality control. Quality control is an easy one. You either care or you don't care. Toyota, Lexus, it's clear. They've made mistakes. We have the sudden acceleration issue. Remember the IS250, that was a dud with direct injected, underpowered vehicle. Wasn't one of their greatest cars in the world, in the planet. Remember also Toyota also had that two and a half liter four banger that was a heavy oil consumption car. Honda, same storyline, 1.5 liter turbo four that actually uses a lot of oil and you can flood it out and you get the oil dilution and all those issues. So clearly there are misses along the way. The real question is, when you do have a failure, what is your next action plan? Is it allowed to run the course or is it to like pump the brakes? We have a problem. Let's get that fixed. And they, that's the big difference here. And a lot of manufacturers make that concerted choice to allow it to go on. Did you also know that NHTSA has been up the back end of a lot of manufacturers because they've been very slow to respond to certain recalls? For example, BMW had issues with airbags. Well, what was the response time on that? Here's a big one. Remember Kia and Hyundai and all those engines that were failing because rod bearings were heating up and engines were burning roadside? Well, now they're facing a lot of heat by NHTSA because of the simple fact that they weren't responding and then they were neglecting customers' complaints on the whole matter 
and really giving everybody a hard time, pushing back, getting their back up about everything, and not really being very intentional and deliberate about correcting some of these issues in due time. Now they're being held to a higher standard, and it's funny because NHTSA now has really got them dialed in and focused on what's going wrong and what's going right. So they definitely have their eyes on that prize. Toyota and Lexus often try to stop midway. If there's an issue within a mid-cycle, they'll try to correct that as soon as they can. Once they get enough feedback from the dealers that filter down to the manufacturing level, then of course, they try to make those changes sooner than later so they don't have ongoing issues that go year after year. What Toyota and Lexus do though, however, in a great way is to maximize quality control they keep repeating what is working. Remember, the definition of insanity is, if it's not working, let's try that again. And it's still not working, let's try that again. Let's keep repeating, it's still not working, let's try it again. That's insanity. Toyota and Lexus do that on the other side. If it is working, carry that through. Why do you think their three and a half liter V6s have been around since the second coming of Christ? It's because it works, it's reliable. They finally found the ingredients. Now it's not the most legendary drivetrain by any means, but it works, it's powerful. It's marginally competitive with the late model cars by BMW, Mercedes and the like. Although it is losing ground and we all know innovation takes those other brands up to a new place and that's part of why BMWs do handle better, they're nicer to drive, but it's that very innovation that can hurt you in the end and it's those costs that you'll be faced with because new engines, new technology, new performance levels, turbos, variable valve timing, all kinds of other factors that make these cars even better to drive year on year is the very reason that Lexus and Toyota sort of restrain themselves and don't jump the gun too quickly. As a matter of fact, did you hear recently they finally got in the new RZ vehicle? That's Lexus's first version of an electric vehicle. Now, every brand manufacturer has essentially been getting on board with that, but Lexus and Toyota are always exercising a little restraint in the name of quality control. Look at other car manufacturers like Jeep, Chrysler, Dodge. They keep making the same brutal mistakes, cheap parts, poor construction, low quality levels, and sadly, a lot of it just keeps getting repeated over and over. Thank goodness at least Dodge finally figured it out and they put a ZF eight speed automatic in some of their vehicles in late model years. Finally, they figured that out because earlier generation Dodge transmissions were guaranteed to fail. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So it's all about quality control, recognizing the weakness, admitting to that, rejigging the system, may have to reach outside the box and actually extend yourself to buy a different group of parts, maybe a different manufacturer, because supply chains can sometimes lock them in. And that's where they get snookered in some other cases where it's too easy to keep going with what you know. It's difficult sometimes to reach out and start to collaborate with other groups. It's easy to go with what's been working for the last five years, 10 years. It's much more difficult to make that change because it means reaching out of your comfort zone. The fifth reason why a lot of vehicles fail early is a simple fact of planned obsolescence. Not all vehicle manufacturers plan their vehicles that way. Every car brand is in the business to sell new cars. That's what makes the world go around. There's some manufacturers that don't necessarily do it totally at the customer's expense. And I personally am of the belief that car manufacturers like BMW are classic planned obsolescence type vehicles. Why? They get in this regime. They sell a car, they expect in three years after the lease is complete that that customer is going to be dazzled by the new generation vehicle. They're going to want to dump that one, get into the next great car. Because they also, if you've noticed with BMW, they make their cars so much better every generation. You look at that conversely to the 911. They go the other way. Porsche makes small, minor step changes to every car and every generation. You can't even tell the difference sometimes between a nicely sorted 997 car and a late model 992. Only the true enthusiast can really pick those details apart. Why? Because Porsche does the little things to constantly improve, make them better a little bit at a time, not overwhelmingly. Whereas BMW wants to blow you away with their latest performance levels. Hit you with the big numbers. 630 horsepower on paper. Look at that amazing new BMW and the performance levels. It's killing everybody in the industry. BMW wants you to buy the new car. So they want you to buy this one. And then three years later, dump that one, get into the next one. So they're designing their cars to last three to five years. So you get outside of that warranty period. Who cares after that? They're designing it that way because they don't want that car that's five or six years old floating around in the industry anymore. They don't really care so much about that. Their money comes from 
the manu- the replacement of new cars, obviously to keep that cycle going around and around. That's a business model that they're adhering to. A lot of other car brands are doing the same thing. In the land of leasing, it's it's too easy for these manufacturers now to just sell a car, let it ride for three years, punt it. It's a perfect business model, isn't it? Don't you think? So ultimately, they want to plan the vehicle to have a very finite life. As a matter of fact, if you don't plan it that way and you plan it to last forever, you won't sell too many new cars. Yes, you'll have a good reputation and all the customers will be very, very happy when they have a nine-year-old BMW that's still running really well. But the business model isn't there. It's not sustainable. And quite frankly, they're not making the money that they are today. And that goes for a lot of brands. If you look at Mercedes, Range Rover, Land Rover, they're notorious for that. Owning them out of warranties going to be an exercise in fertility. How about Jaguar? Well, there's a debate there too. How about Alpha and Maserati? They're all kind of doing the same thing. They create a car that's very cool, sell to the masses, but they're also trying to follow it up with something cool, new, and exciting so that they're ready to pitch that in three to four years. You also don't want to put in the best parts. That then trims off the bottom line and you get to a point where your margins are very, very tight. Why would you do that to yourself as a business? That's the business model. Thanks again, Great Mark, for that question. And as well, everyone right there, check that great video out. The list of five amazing luxury cars that can actually last over 100,000 miles. Hope to see each and every one of you on the next one. Catch you real soon. Bye-bye.